Hi, let's just start another tutorial on on the data flip-flop. Okay, a data flip-flop like the classic, for example, 74 HCT or, or LS 273, which is, by the way, an octo or octopole data flip-flop. Here you are, the symbol, and this is the way it works, you know, the function table. So, after the rising edge of the clock, that's the characteristics, the, the first characteristic and the most important characteristic of a flip-flop, you know, that is the name for. After the rising edge of the clock signal, the D is copied to the Q. So, if D is zero, this is what are you going to save as zero. And if data is a one high, this is what is what you want to save, a one in the queue. And this queue is going to be after the rising edge of the clock. But, you know, the, this device has uh, the same kind of signals, the, the asynchronous signals that are characteristics of a latch. So, for example, here you are the clear direct signal, which means that when active, Q goes immediately to zero, independently of the clock signal altogether, right? This is the data flip-flop that we will study as it is in the tutorial in the web dixies. So here is the same idea, but you know, a kind of a recording to, to, to try to focus the attention on the main needs here, right? So the objective in the end is going to be the basics of this device a kind of an example of timing diagram and how to develop this chip into a BDHDL project for a given target chip like the MAX2 for example APM 2210F and 344 24 pins from Intel and you know the tools that we will use here is the Quartus Prime and the Model Sim Intel Edition Lite alright so well, a data flip-flop, right? So this is what is inside any one of the lo in, inside any of the logic elements that are the typical blocks that you can find in a programmable logic device. Whatever the technology, they are complex PLDs or FPGAs. In the end, it's all around the way. A tiny element that is multiplied to the thousands, you know can develop logic and as well this idea of a one-bit memory cell so in chapter one we saw the logic of it and now we have to see as well uh, some ideas about the data flip-flop which is the key element of this logic element so this is a kind of an example right if the target chip is a complex pld you can find whatever the branch or the vendor, for example, this time for a Shilinx complex PLD, a cool runner too. You can find very well the product lines where you are organizing a, a, the products, all the products of a given function, and then the sum. So in the end, you develop a sum of products, which in the end goes to an output pin directly as it is the case for chapter one combinational circuits or in this case you know we will make use if necessary of the block in green which is in the about anything else a data flip-flop you see you can identify very well the d or the t but basically the t the d flip-flop the d input then the q where the binary data is saved and then the clock signal, you know, and then the asynchronous signals that, if you like, can use, can be in, in so that this block can be used as a latch as well as a flip-flop, because you've got the set direct and the clear direct as well. So this is the unit that is repeated by the thousands, and it is the kernel that you have in every complex PLD or FPGA, right? So, the way to focus this or to organize 
the sequence of steps to get the final results is as usual specifications planning development function functional simulation gate level simulation and mm. if you like you can go to the real board by means of a chip programming and lab prototyping so in case of a specifications you know we can talk here in a way to explain everything that is in the Dixie's tutorial. We can talk about the symbol, an example of timing diagram, the function table. We can talk about commercial chips and try to see if we can identify every item in the datasheet characteristics to the names and conventions that we are using here in CSD. Then we can talk, for example, how to expand to a n-bit data flip-flop. All right, you can as well add details about the internal architecture of this device explained from logic gates and etc. All right, so the location of this tutorial is in the Dixis web P5 because this is where you can find things about one bit memory cells. And you know, it's not this case, the GK flip flop, which is the main issue of the project P5, but you know, in the learning materials, you can go straight to the theory of latches and you can go straight to the data flip-flop tutorial so clicking here you've got the location of this project right so the symbol and the function table and the you know the timing diagram so this is a fundamental idea here and you know the timing diagram has been here in chapter one as well but now talking about time and sequential systems that has memory the time is something fundamental so let's do that you know that you see here as a picture let's solve this or a similar one by means of a, a sheet of paper and a pen let's generate the axis of the signals okay this is the clock, this is the clear direct, and this is the data, okay? So the clock is going to be like that, for example. Clear direct, maybe just a single pulse. Anytime you like, you click clear direct and then you leave it an inactive. So in time, you can imagine this kind of signals and then the data can be anything. For example, something that starts high, then goes low, then goes high faster if necessary, then goes like that. You know, this is a typical data that you may like to sample at a given and a specific time and now what is most important here you know is the idea of the time in time instant when the things are going to happen so before the clear direct you don't have to annotate the time because no one knows about anything what about the output but from and after the clear direct yes this is a time when the things are going to happen this is another rising edge and another rising edge and another rising edge you see you have to go marking the important times which is nothing but the rising edge this is the way you have to proceed here okay and then when you have finished with several pulses just the idea you know is to see if you understand the way it works in time so now what is left here is the final output. So let's generate the final output. All right. Something like this. So it is going to start, you know, for example, before this specific time when you are setting high the clear direct the q you know is not known so 
no one knows if it was a zero or it was a one which was here what was here before this time and now because you are applying a clear direct you know the output becomes very well no zero and zero all the time you have a clear direct applied and after that clear direct until you've get you've got the rising edge nothing has to be changed you know so before the first rising edge all right that appears here the output is kept stable and as it was when you have reset it the system okay then you have the rising edge the first one so this is what you are sampling a one so now the output goes high at least for one clock then you sample another value in the second rising edge so now you save a zero and how how long is going to be this zero stable in the output all this time a full period you know this is what we call the t clock okay and we will assume that this is going to be a constant later in the test bench a constant that can be replaced by any kind of time some nanoseconds and some microseconds whatever so you see the point is go sampling the value at this very specific time so you are photocopying you see you are copying whatever it is in the data to the output if it's a zero a zero and then if you are sampling another zero you see another time a zero and another time you see so all this signal here has been missed at all this is this is going to be nothing but glitches you see that are too fast to be annotated by the system so you sample a zero in between these glitches and this is what you take to the next you see you are sampling zeros sampling zeros okay and then finally you sample a one so this is what you do in the end and synchronously with the rising edge you copy the one that you've got here at the same way you've been copying the zeros all the time right so now another time you are sampling a zero and another time of one so look at this the way the waveform is going to look like so this is the kind of waveform that you have to find in the test bench when solving for example a functional simulation right so what you've got here in Dixie's tutorial is exactly this thing, you know. The data is sampled this time, and this time is what is what you got is a zero. You copy the zero after the reset period, and time, and that way. Then a one, then a zero, and so on. So, and the same thing happens if the signals are two fast they are taken as glitches and are not annotated so once you have seen the way it works well you can inspect a typical or a commercial data flip-flop just reviewing for example the, the data sheet of one of these and this one is a commercial one the noctal or octuple data type flip-flop with reset which is our clear direct and positive edge trigger means that it's active to the rising edge so you know th this is the typical symbol eight flip-flops of the same kind the reset that you've got here is active law is mr underscore l and the cp is nothing but the clock signal okay so then you can see that the rtl of this device is exactly the way it has to be you know one of the boxes is one flip-flop and then the clock 
the, the bubbles and the buffers or in knots it's just what is inside the chip but it's not important if you if you read here cp is because the clock is active at the rising edge right and if you see arm um, air with a bar above that means that is a master clear or a reset clear direct active low and then you have eight of them buffered inputs and buffered outputs so that's the way it is a real chip and finally if you go inspecting for example the typical function table you see some some people are having this kind of or showing or writing or drawing this kind of expanded table but we do it simpler you know we are used to do that simpler okay we we do that in this way precisely we simply annotate d and q in the future all right so they are indicating the clock they are indicating the clear direct active law okay but in the end you see if there is a reset doesn't matter anything else doesn't matter the data or the clear direct because we know that in the future this is what we represent that like that clear direct equal i you know so q equal zero immediately we do that simple annotation down here and this is what you see in this function table from this manufacturer then you can load the one yes this is what we say as uh, save one in which way well if the master clear is not applied you know if the circuit is going to work you see after a rising edge if the data is high you have a high right that, that is what we represent or if you have a zero you have a zero that's the way we represent it you see this is uh this is what we annotate like save a zero and this is what we say as save a one all right that's the way it works and then naturally you can do whatever you like inspecting the other characteristics because this is nothing but a chip so you know you you can see which is the power supply for example seven volts maximum you can see about the current you know the icc current the supply current 50 milliamps so it's quite it's quite high it is eight flip-flops so you see then you can inspect the vi and the vo right the typical vcc five volts so you know that here you have some ranges okay and the range naturally is between the rails of the power supply okay and then you can go and talk about the vi high vi low vo high and vo low as we did in chapter one exactly the same thing for example here you know that uh, room temperature uh, an input low a zero is going to be understood you see as uh, typically you know for five balls or 4.5 balls you see 2.1 is going to be understood yet as a zero and you know 1.35 as maximum is understood as a zero so what is happening here v i low at 4.5 that this is just this is this is wrong right you see it has no meaning 1.35 may be the typical and 1.8 may be the typical for this power supply but you know the maximum should be higher than this so all right like in this temperature range you, there is no way that the minimum i mean that the, the the minimum 
is not necessary to be specified because it has to be zero, right? The rail. But as maximum, 1.35 volts is going to be considered a zero, a digital zero. And so on. You can go inspecting these values here in this way. All right. Mm -hmm. And the current the power supply, this is not the maximum ratings, but the current power supply, all right, typical is 80 or something like this, or, you know, the maximum value depending on the temperature, but you see 8 microamps, that is the typical power supply of one of these classical chips of this technology. Mm -hmm. which is given you an insight about the power you know the power dissipation of this chip the static power dissipation of this chip is going to be icc multiplied by bcc and this is what you get eight microamps multiplied by five volts right and this is the wattage of this circuit so you have 40 microwatts right and then, you know, you can go examining similar chips, perhaps uh, they are slightly different because you see here two different technologies, HC and HCT, they have some slight differences. And then you can see, for example, capacitance and things like that, right? The dynamic characteristics, how much power is draining the circuit when running at very high speed, you know, all right. But th that one, for example, is the one that we used to calculate the same way for combinational circuits, the propagation delay. But you see, these people talk about clock and output. So we have a... Uh, better naming convention this way. This is a TC clock. TCL, right? The propagation time from clock to output. We talk like that. So when you read here that for 5 volts and this kind of output capacitance, you, you can say that 15 nanoseconds is the typical delay of one of these flip flops from clock to output, right? So this means that and the maximum frequency and thing you you can go inspecting this kind of data for the different kind of chips you have specific formulas and definitions but in the end you see these people always talk about the mid value this mid value here to the mid value of the output right so the mid value in the input in this type the clock to the mid value of the output q so this is the Propagation time, yes, it is true, high to low, from 1 down to 0, and from 0 to 1, low to high. But we talk about this, about TC output. So, you have a chip, you are applying clocks here, everything is sensitive to this clock edge, so when this clock edge is here, now the data whatever the value of the data you've got is sampled precisely this time now so the zero here goes to the Q right so the Q is going to be zero in the future right after this rising edge so TC0 is about 15 nanoseconds for this kind of standard logic gate mm -hmm. So if you go and talk about planning, when you have understood the chip and the way it has to work, if you talk about planning, you know, the, the first thing that you have to, to write or to draw is the state diagram, because this is a device that has memory, and you know, this time the system has only two possibilities. You are saving a zero, Q equals zero, or you are just saving a one. So you have to name two states, reset a state and set a state, for example. And then you have to add here the conditions from which you go from one state to the next or the conditions that are going to preserve the state after the rising edge. And that's the main thing, right? That's the typical idea here. You know, this is the typical idea. If anything has to happen, which is 
here a change of state. If anything has to happen, it has to be after the rising edge of the clock. So all the arrows that you see here, the four of them, has a specific condition in this case, but each condition has something associated, and this thing that is associated here is the clock, right? So you can talk about light about this in this way okay so when you see uh, when you see a condition like this d equal one this is what is going to allow you to go from the state reset to the state set it is not only this external signal condition that is what is required here but you have to add here a and you see a rising edge from a clock that that is and that is that it's like that for every single condition so d equal one and a rising edge from the clock so you know that every single arrow looks like that so we do not annotate this because it's understood right so this is what i mean by this external condition so any arrow that you have to have in a state diagram okay any state diagram transition it, it is at least it happens because you have a rising edge in the clock because if not you cannot move anywhere the system is frisked is it's keeping a given state and if it if you have to change the state or you have to loop at the same the state again this is because i insist you have perhaps an external condition and is a rising edge from the clock here present okay so once you have been studying and planning the state diagram you have to think about how to translate this state diagram into VHDL and normally you have several versions and you can do that in many ways absolutely you can see many books on this and every book is doing it in a different way so for example here you are a way in which you are using a flow chart all right from a book you know you can write this data flip-flop directly into the hdl forgetting its internal architecture you only have to think about the way it has to work in this way a high level description so for example if clear direct happens to be one this is going to be translated this rhomboid is going to be translated as a if all right so if this is happening this is because you are you have a clear direct signal so q equals zero immediately if you do not have the clear direct condition what goes next is to ask again by means of another rhomboid in this way if there is a rising edge here and if there is a rising edge you have to ask for example else if so if there is no clear direct but there is a rising edge from the clock signal now is time to save you see this is what is the the meaning q equal d means that you are sampling or copying the data to the q and saving it because if you haven't got the rising edge you do nothing that's the memory uh, property of this system okay so you have this idea and down below you know in the development you have exactly the d flip flop belonging to this system the D flip flop DHDL. So you can inspect it, not in black and white, but it is better to save that or whatever in one way or another and open it in the editor, which is going to give you the colored version of this. So you have the entity, the data flip flop, and then you have the exact translation of the flow chart that is mimicking, you know, the situation of the state diagram. All right, you can take your time here, but it's very simple. If clear direct, you see the if and the else if that you have been annotating in the flow chart is here as an instruction or a statement in the HDL, all right? And so, you know there are many ways to do that as i say this is a typical way that you may find in a book but you know that here in the hdl we have the 
conception in mind to write everything which is sequential at this level, you know, as a finite state machine, which means that even this tiny or simple data flip-flop can be written as a finite state machine. Why not? You have the picture of a finite state machine here in the picture 4 on the left side, and now here you are, the adaptation that you are solving for this data flip-flop. The excess inputs, the external inputs are simply D, so you need a single wire, right? The Z is whatever the number of outputs you've got from your system. Here it is very simple. You only have Q, or perhaps Q and Q naught, two of them. Q and Q naught is also usual. All right. And then you've got the clock and the clear direct that goes straight connected to the state register, which is nothing but, but the RB D flip flop that we have in mind, okay? So that's the point. And then internally, we are going to have three components or three processes specifically, because we will try to do that in a single file. That's the way we do it. So, we have in one hand the state register, which is the data flip-flop, or the R of them, the number of them that you need, depending on the states and depending on the way you are coding the states. So here is very simple, because you have only two states in the machine, set and, and reset the state, so you need only a single wire to save the current state. And here it's going to be that simple that the current state is going to be copied to be the queue, all right? And the current state is not going to be taken into account in the CC1, but the D. The D is going to be copied to the next state. So the CC1 and the CC2 combinational systems are very simple in this circuit, or practically a single wire. But that's not important now. You know, the important thing is the, the, the idea, the strategy that you like to follow here, which is nothing but adapting the general architecture of a finite state machine to the specifics of your data flip-flop or RS flip-flop or GK flip-flop or T flip-flop. You will see that the other tutorials go in the same way. Okay? So this is not the only time that you see this here, but you have it as well in the other tutorials where you plan the design of a flip-flop by means of BHDL. So it is like that, doing it all the time the same way that we learn better the content, all right? It's a kind of a way to adapt whatever you see in books in, in our way in CSD, okay? So, what goes next, once you have decided that you've got this architecture, if you are following this version 2, because if you are following the version 1, you have to do nothing about this. But if you are following the version 2 of this planning, then what you, go, what you have to do next is to invent the state register, the CC1 and the CC2. The state register is not a problem, because essentially it's exactly the same thing that you're seeing here in the picture 3. All right? Is this a specific flow chart? Because it happens that the state register for our state machines here are all the time that have been flopped, so nothing to say, but cut and paste. But the CC1 and the CC2, because they are combinational systems, you have to go back to the chapter 2 and design them the way you like, using gates, max terms, min terms, product of sums, or sum of products, only in or, the way you like as a plan A, or the way you like as a plan C2, or specifically this time for practically all the chapter 2, we have decided to invent the CC1 and the CC2 by means of a single process that is going to mimic the translation of the two table of the block as a behavioral approach, right? So it's going to be plan B for CC1 and a plan B for CC2, practically all the time. Why? Well, because it is good to do it all the time the same way, and because in this Mana, you know, using this approach, we can talk and use the levels. Next state and current state and things like that are going to be possible to be used in the definition of the system when using, for example, here, you know, 
the behavioral approach. So you have to solve a true table for the CC2. This is the true table. Very simple, right? If it happens that now the current state, this is the single input that you've got in the CC2, right? So this is the table that you are liking to solve. Now. One input, current state. If it is such a thing as reset state, the output that you like to have is a zero. And this came from, naturally, the state register, the one which goes in parentheses all the time here in CSD. The outputs are going to be marked, is possible, in a different color, and in parentheses. Okay? So the outputs are going to be specified with the specific two tables. So if you are at reset state, zero. And if it happens that you are at set state, output one. Well, and what goes next, you know, using the plan B from chapter 1, when you have the true table, the next thing to do is, for example, to convert the table into a flowchart, like this case, right? You can have a rhomboid asking for the many number of states that you've got, which is the current state. Here, we, you have only two of them, reset and set. And what is has to happen? If it is the reset state situation, the operation to perform is Q0. Or instead, if you are in the set state situation, Q equal 1. That's simple way to do it. So you see, once you've got this flowchart, you know that immediately, for example, this time using a case instruction or a statement in BHDL, you have the text file. And the same for the other function to table. You know, you have another combinational secret to design, the CC1, which has an input which is D, and another input which has this level, uh, current state, so you have two inputs now, and you have to generate another output, and then output is not the Q this time, the output is next state, another signal of a single wire. So, this is the table, right? D, current state, you can use these dotted lines to separate these things, to make it easy, because now, what is, what you have to do? Well, you have to transform all the four arrows, you see, one, two, three, four arrows, which are for changing or keeping the states, transiting between the states, you know, this is the job of the CC1, uh, right here as a signal. Which one is going to be the next state to go? You see, the next state is connected to the D, that is going to be copied to be the current state after the rising edge of the clock. This is the way it works, okay? That can be very well understood here in this simple true table. For example, if you analyze the cycle reset a state, you can just draw the arrow when d equal 1, because if d equal 1 and you are at reset a state, the next state to go after the rising edge, you know, once you've got the rising edge from the clock, is set a state. But if you are at the reset state and you have a zero, what you want is to loop, right? Reset the state again for another clock, period. And the same thing with the other state. And the same thing if it happens that you have more states, which is going to be the case for the next exercises and projects. So if you've got a true table, what goes next is simply the translation again. You see, you repeat it again. That's a good thing. You don't have to think about anything else here, but a repetition. Let's try to find the flow chart, which is going to be the behavioral interpretation of this true table for the CC1. And in that way, you may ask for the current state. You see this, the horizontal separations are like this. You are going to separate the state by a state. So you are going to be occupied yourself solving one state at a time. If it happens that you are at the reset state, well, this time is not straightforward as before. You see, this time you have to ask about the value of D. If you are at the reset state and D happens to be 1, you know, if you say so, yes, the next state has to be set state. A jump from reset state to set state. This is what has to happen. But if you are at the reset state and D is 1, and this is not true, you have to keep the state, reset state. So the next state, the output of this combinational system has to be 
something, you know, a value, a signal value that has to be a refreshment, refresh the same state in which you are. And the same thing for the set state and many more if that was the case. All right. So, you know, it's, it's larger, but it has great advantage because it's, it's always interpreting and adapting the same architecture. You know, this kind of a magical thing that is a finite state machine. It is used for absolutely everything. You see, you it can even can be used for a single data flip flop. So now what you see here, all right, is nothing but if you are following the version two, one or the other, the version two this time has the same name because you are inventing the same device. But when you save this to see it in colors, in colors, you know, well, what are you going to see now is the entity, the same entity naturally, but, you know, the architecture is going to be consistent with the flowchart that you've been inventing and the general architecture of the finite state machine naturally. This is why we talk about FSM-like. So, first of all, you see that we have special signals here. We have an enumeration of signals. The levels, that's very important. We are going to enumerate the levels that we are using in the every state. That's good, because the levels, you know, are going to be translated into wires of some kind, this type, type of state type. And so you have signals, you know, in the diagram, you have two signals. The one that are wired, you know, here in green, you see. The wires in green are ex internal signals of this architecture. All right, the ports are the Z and the X and the clock and the clear direct, but not the next state and the current state. Those are internal signals of this machine. So this is what you see here in signal, current state, next state, state type. And the state type means that they can be just these two possibilities, reset state or reset state levels. And so then you have to see that you have between separated by commons, you know, a state register, which is nothing but the D flip flop that you've seen before. So the code that was developed before is here as well. If clear direct is high zero, you know, you are using a level here. The level is to assign reset state. You know, you can have this reset. This constant is the state type reset is to make it easy. All right. So if current state reset, if current state is going to be reset immediately if you've got a clear direct activation. But if not, but you are detecting a clock event and the clock is one, this is a detection of a rising edge. All right. The current state is going to be the next state. Why? Because the next state is the D. The D input of the flip flop. So the D input goes to the Q like that. And then you know you have the CC1, which is something like this, you see? The CC1 process, the CC1 block combinational circuit. And you see the case allows you to go and separate when reset and when set. Very good, because in this way, you have four arrows and every arrow is very clearly indicated here or translated. You know, if D is one in the reset state, the next state is set state. If D is zero, is the same state and so on. And the same with the other process, CC2. In this case, you know, a simple buffer because what you want to do if it happens that you are in the reset state, you only like to do this, q equals zero. All right. And when you are in the set state, what you want is to say q equal one. That's all. You see that that very simple structure is a kind of a translation of the, the flip flop. So naturally, when you've got everything understood and translated into BHDL, now you are developing this, you know, and you can do that continuing, you know, uh, organizing a project in some kind of EDA tool 
and see what happens with the RTL and the RTL result has to be something very similar to what you see here in some way or another that depends on the tool but in the end you see you have to see that the specific D flip flop that was there in the logic element has been identified so that the number of registers you know looking at the general statistics you know the number of registers that the flip-flop used you know very well that has to be one all right that's the point so if you proceed developing the problem in for example quartus prime light edition you have to have a single file and that you have the file in the right folder the project name which is for example the flip-flop prj and a target chip, for example, the Max 2 EPM 2210F 324C3. And so you can go through the full flow, the design flow, and in the end you can investigate what is going to be what is generated as an RTL. So you go to tools and inspect the RTL view, and this is the latch. Okay. That's the likes that you have in mind, okay? And the technology view shows you the, practically the same thing, okay? A different picture, but the same thing, a latch or a, a flip-flop that is clocked, all right? And has an asynchronous clear, which is our clear direct signal, data and queue, right? That's the circuit. And if you see the project summary or the compilation report you know <coughs> and you see the many registers or the general register statistics you see that you have one register used that belongs to is exactly the the latch the flip flop that you are in designing okay so our target chip now has been used well a single a single data flip flop that's the one that you've been synthesizing okay so that's the end of the developing process so you can you have specified the circuit remember the symbol you've been drawing a timing diagram you've been talking about the function table we examined in detail the characteristic of a commercial chip and well we went planning this thing and we had two options or version one which was a simple file or this version two which is about the translation of a finite state machine which is like the state register the cc1 and the cc2 and then we have run a eda tool and we have synthesized and we have watch we, we we can go and annotate the rtl and the technology schematic so now it's time for uh, a con continuing with the functional simulation so the aim now is very simple let's go back to the timing diagram that we have in mind and let's translate it into a test bench so we can run the functional simulation first if you like later the gate level simulation to determine for example how fast is this circuit for this max to target all right so in order to start the functional simulation we have to go and examine again the ideas that are there in the timing diagram that was our timing diagram and we can fix for example a period a clock period you know for example i don't know two point five microseconds okay so you see you have 20 pulses here or something like that so you can run uh, very well for uh, 100 microseconds and in this way 1000 doesn't matter you have to run the simulator for that time or something like that in order to have time to see the behavior of the circuit uh, from one clock to the next so you have to start, you know, for example, uh, stating that the signals are zero and or the data is one, and then at some times you will change the values of these of these signals. 
so that you can reproduce the the activity that you have here in your mind or in your paper you know you can reproduce those tiny glitches as well or whatever so that you can see for real which is going to be the queue of your circuit the output of your circuit once it has been simulated but you know to do that you have to think in the way it is going to be organized the test bench it is going to be a box you know that you are going to name test bench or something like that all right it is going to be a close box and inside you will locate a process and another process this time two processes so that you'll be able to to test your unit and the test okay now that is going to be the, the layout of the test bench two processes because one of the processes is going to be the clock that is going to go driving the clock signal okay of the unit and the test so this is going to be the d flip flop and the test it's going to be the unit i1 for example all right so the clock is going to come from this process that is going to be set so that you have a square wave or this a rectangular wave right doesn't matter you can have very well a periodic rectangular wave which is the same thing because in the end what is important here is the rising edge of the wave it doesn't matter the well the frequency yes you know the the clock period that's right the clock period of the, of the signal t clock this is the parameter that you're going to translate into a constant but the shape it is a squared or it is a rectangular doesn't matter very much all right and then for example you will have another a stimulus process uh, to generate you know for example the data and the clear direct pulse the clear direct is going to be something simpler a single pulse at the beginning to establish a known position for the queue and then the data right another signal that you have to drive with some pulses of whatever information that you have in mind to sample at the given time and in the end you know you will see uh, you will be able to watch in time by means of the wave diagram you know whatever is you know a repetition of the clock that's very important to see all the clocks in time right through the simulation and then you have to see you know the clocks and then the pulls and whatever the data is that you like to translate to the queue and so the calculation of the queue right so you, the aim of this simulation as usual is to calculate the queue so this is why you are going to run this in time to see the, the waveform and in the end you like to compare what you get from this test bench to the one that you know from your sketch okay that's the aim of the the test benching process in BHDL. So everything here is going to be BHDL. So this is going to be the the unit and the test. This time only a file D flip flop BHT and the test bench is going to be as well. Uh, it's going to be with extension TV BHD, right? So that that's the idea. All right. So in Quartus Prime you have the entity you have the analysis and synthesis to the end so now it's time for processing start a test bench template writer in this way you can go to the project folder which has to be somewhere lcsd p5 d flip flop a simulation model sim and here is your turn to, to copy the VHT control C up there and paste it 
and now you have to change the file extension of this file so that it would be something like tflop tv.bhd right you change the file extension and now it's your turn to edit this thing so that it is automated you know it has been generated automatically so you have the entity the flip flop bhd then the architecture and then you know that here you have to place uh, you you have to make room to place the clock period constant and where you are going to find that thing well in Dixies, right in Dixies, precisely once you have seen the development you go down to testing and here you have an example of a test bench from other semesters so down there you find the way to write the clock period definition so control c and paste it into the file right so you see and now it's time for example for writing the frequency you like or the period for example 2.5 microsex this is what you've got in mind in your all right this is what you are you are thinking about for example in your test bench or in your waveform something like this okay 2.5 micro microseconds which means uh, 4 megahertz of clock frequency and you know that this is going to be running for more than 100 mega 100 microseconds okay you have to leave time to the simulator to run the many clocks that you've got here okay so 2.5 microseconds and this means uh, 4 megahertz for example and this means that you will run the simulator for for example 400 microseconds that's going to be enough and now is your turn to go down there and delete the process always and the process in it because we have something in mind here and this something in mind is in this sketch now we have to copy a process for the clock and then another clock process for the stimulus signal so the process for the clock is here as an example you see it is going to be called if you take it as it is here clock signal so this process clock signal is the clock right so now is your turn to to generate a square wave or a rectangular wave as you like for example you can say clock period uh, one third of the period zero okay and then clock period multiplied by two and you you see two over three that's the two thirds at one so in this way you are generating a rectangular wave uh, of 30 uh, 66 percent of duty cycle right it is a six percent 66 percent of the time is one two thirds and one third is zero that's all right clock signal you know the shape is not important whatever the shape that you have in mind the, the important thing here is that you have a kind of a peri periodical signal with a rising edge so now it's your turn to copy something about the stimulus signal another process you know so you can copy it all from the web to the end it's called steamproc so you copy the steamproc here and now you can watch a little bit about it and see if it is adjusting to what you have got in mind or not for example this is an initialization so what is what you've got in mind is here right so the initialization is this initial period in which the signals are not defined yet nothing has happened 
so right then you you are asserting the clear direct so you know how long well for example here you are asserting it for example if one of these squared is a period so you are asserting it 0 8 you know 0 8 times a period or it doesn't matter very much how long you are which time you are keeping the signal high it doesn't matter very much right what are you trying to do is to just generate a clear direct signal so for example this may be uh, what 1.1 times clock period right just if you like to mimic exactly what you have in mind so you see clock equal one and then wait for 1.2 clock period then zero and so this is this is the clear direct pulse the initial right then if you like you can simulate more more of them and now it's time for the signals for example now you like to set high the d how long well several clocks for example one two or three clocks is going to be high right so you may say that you like well 2.2 .2 or three three times the clock period high so this is setting the data one and then you say data equals zero and so it is going to last for one two or three all right so zero and wait for 3.4 times the clock period and then you know you see i've got here one two or three glitches you can simulate them very well you know the glitch is something that lasts less than one clock and probably is not going to be detected in the final simulation so you can generate the glitch like this you see and for half of for example half of the clock period clock period multiplied by 0 0.52 that's a glitch and then later on in time another one for example here all right if you like another one you simply copy these down there and you are going to have another glitch for example shorter than these two zero thirty three right something like this another and another if you like okay you can wait for a, a little bit zero two clock periods and then if you like another one why not it's up to you to simulate what you want for example just another one which is yet shorter than one clock so in principle all these glitches are not going to be detected perhaps there is a coincidence of one of the glitches with a rising edge and then yes but normally it doesn't have to happen okay this is means that you are receiving interferences or interferences from other systems or whatever so why the an interference has to be detected probably not right and then you really start yeah, this is the signal to be sampled and now you know you are asserting ones and zeros and ones and zeros the meeting times you like to the end so this is what is going to be finally sampled and saved in at, at the output queue so this is a good example i don't know if it's exactly this but you know pretty much the same right so this is an example of a typical stimulus waveform which becomes you know in this picture this process stimulus that is going to you be used to attach the data in to the d in the flip-flop and the clear direct all right so save it as it is you know and now go back to the quartus light and now it's time to quartus prime it's time for organizing an rtl simulation so you can launch it
So the simulator starts a new window. Right, and now is your turn to organize a new process. So file, but I got another one with the same name, so better if I go and delete. So file, new, project, let's browse to the right location, this is P5 and D flip flop, that's the location I like for this project, the project name is D flip flop PRJ, and the default library it's going to be work functional. Okay, so you say right, and now you have to add existing files, and the existing files that you've got here are the two of them the test bench and the entity to be tested. You know, you say right, and now it's time for watching if it is everything all right. Okay, green ticks. So now it's time for a starting simulate the start simulation. And what is exactly what you like to simulate? Work functional, the test bench. All right, the test bench. You say right. This is what you like to simulate, right? The, the enclosure that has no inputs. This is what has been named like that. D flip flop BHDL TST. So you say right, and now the machine starts a waveform generator a display like that. So now it's your turn to attach here everything which is in the region. So attach to the wave all items in region. And now, if you like, you can organize them the way you know from the sketch. So you can even Add here a new divider output. Okay. And move the queue down here. So you have a separation between inputs and outputs. Now is your turn to move the simulator, right? Like room 400 microseconds. In this way, it has to work. And in the end, you have to five, well, many clocks. And when you start zooming here, you see, you see the signals, the initial pulse, the clock, you see the clock is not squared, but rectangular, you see the way we've been doing that. And now is your turn, you know, to see if everything is all right. And this is a good picture that you can capture in the right way, as you like, okay? Like using the snipping tools. So I can use the snipping tools to get this picture. Okay. And once you've, I've got this picture, I can start commenting it. For example, okay. Well, first of all, you've got no clear direct, no data. The clock is here ticking. But you know, up to this point, this is for nothing, you know, you are waiting for this, this time when the queue has to be defined. So this is for nothing, right? And here you have to have a zero, right? This is okay. And now you are waiting for the first convenient rising edge, this one, okay? So here at this point, you are sampling a zero and the zero is copied. So now you have for one clock, which goes up to this point. You see, so now it's tricky because you see it is a kind of a coincidence, but it's not true. This is a zero. So the zero is copied for another clock. And now you are sampling a one. So the one is copied. So this is the output that goes high. And then you sample another one and sample another one so you see you're sampling a one then the signal goes down but doesn't matter very much because for a full period up to this point you have a one and now you are sampling a zero so it works as expected 
Finally, you know that you have some tricks here. For example, one of the signals which is lasting less than one clock period, this is what it takes. A clock period. So this one is shorter as you have inputted. But this one has been sampled because here you are the rising edge from the clock. But you see, this one has not seen. Okay. When it is the time for sampling, you see, you are sampling a zero and then you are sampling again here the one you see so this glitch has been detected and so the next signals but not this one and this one you see so you may say that this is a good uh, analysis of what has been happening with this d flip flop okay finally you, you have to see that whatever it is the input is something that goes from one to zero and if this happens is because you've got in this precise time you know this in this instant of time a rising edge so that's that's the full or a, a good explanation of what happens here and it has to match very well uh, well your your idea that you've got in your paper or the same idea that you've got from the web tutorial so in the web tutorial you have something like this which has to be very similar and you have something like that from the very beginning which is exactly uh, the same idea so, right so in, in the end by means of a functional simulation you've been able to verify that the system works as expected and perhaps if you like, the last section of this tutorial is about the gate level simulation. In case you like to go and examine or ask or answer the question, which was how fast was the circuit? Or is the circuit that you've been synthesizing for this specific target that was a max 2? So in order to do that last step, the gate level simulation, you know that you have to come back to to the quartus prime environment you know and now it's time for a starting a new processing this time what the EDA netlist writer but before doing that remember that you have to be sure that everything is all right and uh, all the clicks are in place and this means that you know the process settings the project settings you know the EDA settings simulation because now you know that you have to generate as well the delay file and as well as the translation to the VHDL of the technology view so you have to pay attention that the EDA tool settings in simulation more EDA uh, netlist writer settings is all off right so be sure that you know everything is off here you say okay right and now it's time for processing the start you know this time not the test bench because you've got it but the EDA netlist writer you say so and the machine start writing the 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 flat files the technology flat fly the two of them so now is your turn to see if this is been in the simulator simulation folder in model sim and here you are this is the bho and this is the sdo the two files that go together in the final gate level simulation all right so this is what you can launch now launched in this way rune simulation tool gate level simulation you say rune for example a slow model and now another model sim processing has to start you can switch off the other one that you had here it's not any more required but you can open the new one which is empty and now is your turn to go and file new project right and this time is going to be located in the in the same place 
the flip flop. The project name is as usual the flip flop gate level sim, right? And the work gate level. So that, that is going to be the idea. Okay. The same folder but different project names and libraries of devices so you say okay and now is your turn to add to the existing existing files but not you know the dhd the the high level one but the technology one so from this location of the project you can pick up the same test bench you can say open it say okay and then you can get another one which is going to be located you know this is the one that we do not move. We go and fetch it in simulation, model sim, you know, the BHO. And then, if you like, you can take as well the other one, which is the SDO, just to remember that thing. It goes together, the test bench, the technology view, and the standard delay output file. They go together like that. So you say, okay and you can add them all to the project and now you can close these mini windows and you can say uh, you can check if everything is all right now and you can now go and test or simulate start the simulation of what now well the gate level right the same test bench but at this gate level level and the standard delay file to be added here you know which one is here it is the flip flop bhd sdo that one and it is applied to the region that you can go and examine this the region in which it is applied is the name of the entity test bench and you know i know that this has a tricky name because we do not change it so you have to open it just to get the name is that one D flip flop bhd so this is the name so this delay file has to be applied in the region of the test bench and in which place exactly the entity i1 all right which is the d flip flop you say okay okay and now the machine has to start running a new wave window or something so you do the same thing now, you see the, the wave is showing you everything, so you can say add to wave all items in region, you have the same as before, you can rearrange them in the same way, adding dividers if necessary, and now you can run for 400 microseconds, and let's see what happens, okay? zoom all let's zoom to the and now you know everything has to be the same naturally but you can pinpoint a specific transition which transition well one like this one here which is representing that in this you know in this rising edge that you see from the clock the output is transiting is changing you know from zero to one so this is a good time for example to measure the propagation time from clock you see from clock to output okay so you zoom and now in the end you go to the level of nanoseconds you can expand them as much as you like because it goes down to the picoseconds but it's not going to be necessary but you see here you've got one cursor on the transition the clock's transition and then you can add another device like this another cursor and you can locate the other one precisely when at the time when you've got finally the transition from zero to one because this is what has been sampled okay so that's the final idea. It takes 4.2 or something nanoseconds, which means that 4.2 
nanoseconds is something like a very high speed, you know, 238 mega earth, right? So a single flip-flop located in this chip can go that fast, 238 mega earth. Because now, once you've got the final value, it means here that you can already have another rising edge to, to make the circuit work. So, you know, the minimum clock period is just like that. This is a kind of a minimum clock period. And if you're not, you are not so, such, you're not sure at all of this, because this is just a specific transition of the many that you can have here, especially when the circuit is larger than the single flip-flop, right? You can go back, this was 4.2 nanoseconds, you can annotate that, and you can naturally print the screen, you print this screen and make some comments here, right? Exactly, you can comment that. And once you've done this work, you can go back to the Quartus and run the, the right tool this time, the right tool to determine the worst case scenario, you know, you, so you can start now another tool, which is not going to be a simulator, but the timing analyzer, let's see if it works for this device. Because, you know, these, these tools are specified for every specific chip, and sometimes they differ from one chip to the next. So this time that is a max, let's see what happens. All right. We've you have run this process. It says that the timing analyzer was successful, no errors. So now it's time to go and examine the results from the timing analyzer. So you run the tool timing analyzer and you will see the spreadsheet and everything. Okay. So that's it. And I remember that what you want is a specific report and the final uh, setting of the output. So, for example, the, you know, the datasheet report, clock to output. So, something like this for, you see, for the data port is the queue, the output and clock port is the clock and so rise and fall so this is more or less exactly the same time that we've been measuring in the gate level right 4.18 so this is exactly the measurement that we've got here when zooming in this transition all right mm -hmm. i've got to another than this, this is the transition. So if you zoom this, you have to measure something like that. You see, it's two and now 4.19 or 4.18. You see, so the timing analyzer is generating the same information that you see here in this instrument. All right, so this is a kind of a long tutorial, but well, the idea is to discuss the many ideas that you can you can go through ruining this or inventing the circuits and this is only one flip-flop you can do something similar with any kind of circuit that you know all right that's all thank you